welcome to the May 2024 edition of City Connection. This live TV program brought to you by the Grand Rapids Community Media Center offers the community the chance to hear from and ask questions directly to their local city officials. I'm your host, Allison Donahue. Filling in for Mayor Bliss this month is Second Ward Commissioner Melinda Isasi. Joining the commissioner later on in the episode will be Yvette Pittman, the Special Events Manager for the City of Grand Rapids. And in the second half of the show, we provide time with both the commissioner and our guests to take some of your questions and comments. If you'd like to take part in this live conversation, you can send your questions to cityconnection at grcmc.org. City Connection, a collaboration between the CMC, GRTV, the City of Grand Rapids, and the Rapidian is live today, May 6, 2024, on Community Access TV, Channel 24. Welcome, Commissioner Isasi. How are you doing? Thanks, Allison. I'm doing well. Great, great. Thanks for coming on. It's always good to see you. It's yes. beautiful springtime it now. It's beautiful outside. I think the last <laughs> time we were together, it was still the, the pits of winter. <laughs> I think so. So yeah. we're parking on both sides <laughs> of the street again, <laughs> thankfully. So we have a few questions uh, sure. to get into, so we might as well jump right into them. Okay. One of the big things I've been seeing um, while covering the um, city commission meetings and planning commission meetings that have been going on for the last couple months, mm -hmm. people are asking about the zoning changes yes. that are coming up. Mm -hmm. Can you just fill us in a little bit about what those are? Really break it down to like Yes. Let's pretend everyone on the other oh my side gosh, of the okay. cameras are eighth graders. <laughs> Let's really break it down on what these zoning changes okay. will mean for sure. Gen Well, the important thing to note is that we did vote on those zoning changes um, at our last public meeting, and then those take effect. Um, and so right now we're working on the implementation process, um, which we would have for any other ordinance changes that we make. But there were five that were considered. I'll take it back um, to, to what you said. We. I would say even before I was on the commission, um, my past colleague, Commissioner Ruth Kelly, said this is probably something you're going to vote on, some zoning changes, because cities, the, mo the one of the biggest ways that we can impact housing and density is by making zoning changes. And so uh, back even before that, there was great housing strategies, there were housing now, and then really the commission with the planning commission to look at what are some potential things that we could change to adjust to try to increase the housing stock. And the whole idea is that you increase the housing stock so then there are more choices, so then people can sort of fall into sort of the best housing option for them. Um, and that was done through work with Housing Next, through Brooke Osterbrook, Ryan uh, uh, Kilpatrick, and other individuals who are really practitioners in this space, as well as the Chamber of Commerce, other groups um, like Together West Michigan. Um, so they've been voted on. It was unanimously passed, which, you know, not everything also always happens unanimously. There was a lot of rigorous debate. But back in July of 23, we had a joint city commission and um, city planning session where we talked about the five proposed changes. One was looking at changes to accessory dwelling units or ADUs or sometimes called grandparents flats or there's all sorts of names for them. How could we make them more affordable, more accessible? And also looking at things like, do they still need to be owner occupied? Um, I can't remember the length of time that we've had. I think it's been nine years since we enacted ordinance changes to allow for ADUs. And in that time frame, I think 10 had been built to give everyone a perspective of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, the second is uh, a switch from four unrelated persons able to live together in a single um, structure to six unrelated persons. Again, looking at how could you increase that housing stock, but also recognizing that family, the definition of families and who wants to live together has changed over the years. Uh, my husband and I, we are, we are uh, living in the same house that we bought 15 years ago. We don't have any children, we don't have any pets. Um, and so for us, our, our living environment is different than probably it was for my parents and my grandparents. Um, third was really to look at um, a single room occupancy or in transitional housing. So this would be typically if somebody wants to rent out a, one of the spaces in their rooms, but also for um, different housing providers that might be providing transitional houses or shelters. Um, and that was to eliminate some of the requirements as it related to what had to go in front of planning commission, what were things that were allowed by right, so by the ordinance, so it doesn't 
require individuals to go to a planning commission to sort of make their case to have this variance. Um, the fourth was on small scale development, so looking at opportunities of how we could do infill in smaller lot sizes. Um, that's been uh, really touted, I think, uh, Commissioner Repart, back when he was on the commission, would send me articles about small scale development. We have some really good examples of that all, all over the city. And then the last was um, some of the waivers as it relates to, or I'm sorry, reduction in some of the parking requirements. Um, uh, six or less uh, units and, and saying, okay, if this is if this is one of the parking pieces and it's in, a tip, in this uh, traditional neighborhood, then we're gonna waive that, that required parking. Um, all of those were studied immensely by the Planning Commission. I thank them for their work. Um, they did that over a course of, from July, they started I think almost immediately after and they did that all the way up until January of this year. February, we started to hear how those conversations went. They unanimously passed those five changes um, at their planning commission body and then it came to us for, I think we had four sessions ourselves. We moved out one of the sessions due to spring break. Um, I will say I heard everything from, I don't want any of these changes. This is gonna change what my neighborhood looks like. This is frustrating. I didn't hear about this. Why are we not waiting for the planning commit or the planning master planning process to go forward? I heard, and then on the other hand, I heard, we need to do more to create more density in Grand Rapids. People wanna live here, they're leaving because it's not affordable. And so, and then there was a lot of people in between, and there's probably people watching right now who didn't even know that these changes were enacted. Um, so thank you all for highlighting it. Um, and so again, the belief is that Grand Rapids is the city that people want to live in. Yes, there have been some small adjust, adjustments and changes in population decline, that's really because people are finding it unaffordable and so they have to go and seek out other places to live. Um, that's been certainly stories into my office. Um, but we also know that there is tremendous growth here in the city. Uh, we're building a lot of amenities, different quality of life, we have universities and, and people want to be here in the city. Um, and so a recognition that also people may be housed, but maybe their housing is not the quality they'd like. Maybe they're living with more people than they'd like. Maybe they're living with family members, what we call two and three tripled up. So like two times the amount of people that be sh should be living in a space, right? Or they're further away from their job and they would love a 10 minute commute versus a 35 minute commute. So those changes are enacted. We voted on them unanimously. Um, I think like many things that we do, yes, we have the master planning process that we'll talk about. And as a city, we also have to enact ordinance changes at all different times. And um, I'll look forward to that implementation and continue education that we'll do with our neighbors about these changes. Yeah, I wanted to ask mm -hmm. too, just because like you mentioned, there was so much debate and yes. people felt very passionately on yes. both sides. Yes. What was something that you learned during this process, yeah. listening to all of the community members share their yeah. piece? Yeah, I think, I don't know if this was something new that I learned, but that you know, housing is such a personal choice to individuals. You know, I mean, people tell me and my husband, you guys should live in a bigger house and you should move somewhere else. And I'm like, I'm never home. So for me, my housing choice is perfect. And however, I'm in that house that I bought 15 years ago. So I never moved to that next, you know, we'll call away from that starter home to that mm -hmm. next level. So that's what we're trying to do. But that stock probably wasn't there for me to go to the next level or my, my, the cost of my housing was gonna increase exponentially. And so by creating more opportunities for housing, well again, we hope to uh, alleviate, I think at one point we had the lowest vacancy rate in the country. I don't think we're there anymore, um, but it's just that it's extremely personal and this is what I told somebody is, it can be true that you want things to stay the same in your neighborhood and that you also care about more housing for other neighbors in Grand Rapids. Um, and so what I appreciated was organizations that came together to host different sessions. I did at least four sessions with groups in the second ward. There was a number of num neighborhood associations that did it on their own. They sent letters in, I think almost, at least in the second ward, I know Creston did, and so did Midtown. Um, Heritage Hill had some differing opinions. And so in the end, we have to make decisions about what is in the best interest of the city in totality. And so I could have one, one person saying, what if this happens? And there was a lot of discussions about, um, you know, who's coming in and buying different properties. I can't control that as a city commissioner. What we can do is create 
hopefully ordinances that allow for more development, development that allows people to have the choice in the housing that they want, healthy housing, and helping to reduce that cost burden. You know, people are paying certainly 50%, there are stories of people paying 70% of their income mm -hmm. for housing, and that just is not right, so yeah. Great, well thank you so <laughs> much for breaking that down. Sure. I know it's complicated and people feel passionate about it, so that, that makes it a little complicated yes. to understand yes. too. Um, I also, you mentioned the community master plan, um, and I wanted to talk with you a little bit about that too. So mm -hmm. the community master plan defines the vision of our city's growth over the next 20, 20 years. years. Mm -hmm. um, and that is things from equity and housing, environmental justice, economic development. Um, there's a few upcoming workshops mm -hmm. where community members can provide their input or their feedback yes. for those draft recommendations. Can you tell us about those upcoming events and what folks can expect if yes. they want to go? Yeah, so the, the sessions are going to be tomorrow, Wednesday, or tomorrow, Wednesday and Thursday. Um, Tuesday's in the second ward at GRPS University. All events are from 5 to 7. The one in the, uh, the, the third ward is at Ottawa Hills High School, and then the one in the first ward is at Sibley Elementary School. Um, there'll be some dinner. I think right at the beginning is a, a self-guided kind of review of the draft. Then there's dinner and then there's additional discussion. Um, and so, yes, it, it's to review where is the draft to this date. It's important to note that this process has been, again, has, has been some time. Um, we started during COVID. We didn't expect it to be COVID, but it started. Many thanks to the over 50 steering members um, that are Grand Rapidians who, offer, who offered their insight and expertise and who represented lots of different demographics around age and race and income level and housing type. And so I'm so appreciative of them. Um, so you mentioned all of those areas. I'll also mention, you know, topics around transit, topics generally around uh, density, um, topics that relate to, uh, you know, what is that, that green space or the third spaces that mm -hmm. we are often talking about. And so this is that chance to say, what do I can, you know, is almost, I think in some ways it's a reaffirming of what we heard because I think we had over almost 6,000 neighbors that have participated mm -hmm. in this master planning process. I can't do the percentages in my head, Allison, but you know, I think for a city our size to have that many people who have come out and then that's not even counting, I think, individuals who have been engaged in some of our neighborhood meetings. There've been some tours around master planning process where we're taking people um, through street by street, just talking about what could be here, what could this look like? Um, and so I think it's a bit of a reaffirming, which we consistently heard more quality housing at better price points for all neighbors. That that has stuck out through the whole process. Mm -hmm. um, people want to continue to have green spaces and places to have recreation, multiple types of things. And then, um, you know, certainly transit um, has come into play, which is an interesting dynamic for us. Even though we're not the transit authority, we do need to think about that and consider it. So that's some of the stuff that we've been doing even beforehand with our micro mobility. And then we have a car share program that I think we voted on in March. That will be rolling out a pilot. Yeah, that's yeah. coming up too. So what is the next step in the process? Yep. So the next step in the process is this draft piece. People have that option to go. Then it'll come back um, to city commission for it to be presented back to us. And then it'll go through an approval process. I don't think we have the defined dates of when that final vote will happen. There will be another public hearing for people to offer any suggestions if they're not able to come to this um, sessions. Also, people can write us at any time to share this is the thoughts that I have. Maybe they read about the master planning process. Maybe they went to the first one, but not the second one. Um, um, and then and then we'll begin that work of the implementation of what does this look like? Another evaluation of other zoning pieces, other ordinance changes that we might need to make to be able to fully um, live out that master plan for the next 20 years. Are we thinking approval by the end of the summer? I think that we talked about maybe not the end of, it might be closer to the fall. Okay. Um, mostly because sometimes in, in June we have a little break. Some of our meetings are a little smushed together. Um, and so I would say, but certainly, you know, looking to do that in the fall. And again, that was some of the questions about the zoning changes. But to me, the zoning changes were one piece that we have to make zoning changes all the time. And the master plan process, we had a process, we were working with a consultant, we we're working with the neighbors. And um, this is really that, that long-term plan for those next 20 years. Yeah, yeah, and it is 20 years. So this opportunity <laughs> to play a role in yes. creating that master plan is 
about as rare as a solar eclipse. Yes. <laughs> so now's the time to get involved now is the time. if you want yes. to have a voice in how Grand yes. Rapids looks for the next 20 years. Absolutely. So it's about time for us now okay. to take our first break. But when we come back, I will be talking with the city's special events manager, Yvette Pittman. Stay tuned. For over 30 years after humble beginnings as a public access TV station, the Community Media Center has grown to be an active, multi-platform media and technology assistance organization, encouraging and enabling our community to push the creative boundaries. We power a variety of resources, including a music-centered community radio station, WYCE, a community venue with stage and screen at Wealthy Theater, citizen-driven journalism with the Rapidian, a web development team empowering local nonprofits, an education department that trains and broadens students' minds, and a free speech public access television studio, GRTV, where it all began. By introducing audiences to new voices and ideas, we enhance community engagement and create connections between artists and audiences, enriching our city's cultural offerings. We empower and collaborate with platforms and resources accessible to all and used by all. Every free democratic society depends on media, accessible to the community and uncensored by government. The Community Media Center continues this work for the media landscape of today and tomorrow. These platforms and services empower our neighbors to tell their stories and explore the richness of culture that Grand Rapids has to offer. Connect, discover, learn, create, and share the Grand Rapids Community Media Center. Welcome back to City Connection. If you're just now tuning in, I'm Allison Donahue, and in this segment, we get the chance to talk with Yvette Pittman, the Special Events Manager for the City of Grand Rapids. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you for making the time to, to come on our show today. So to get us started in this segment, for those who are unfamiliar, can you tell us a little bit about the Office of Special Events? I'm sure people don't know that there's a department in our city that's developed or really just has the goal of putting on community building events here in Grand Rapids. Um, and then tell us a little bit about your role within the department as well. Absolutely, Allison. I agree with you. I didn't know that the city of Grand Rapids had an office of special events and then what does that office do? Mm -hmm. So the role of the office of special events is to permit events to occur on public property within the city of Grand Rapids. So any event um, that has a distinct time, place, um, kind of description and you want to bring in food trucks or entertainment like concerts or DJs and invite people to gather on a public space um, does need a special event and so our uh, permit and so our office uh, exists to make sure folks know how to get those permits and to help them obtain those permits so that we can have all the vibrancy that everybody sees and enjoys here in the city of Grand Rapids and so I manage the office and there are 
four more folks on our team uh, that help folks through that permit process. We just rolled out a new permit application using a new platform called Acela. So we're hoping that folks, as they are applying for these permits, will give us feedback so that we can continue to make that system better. So what is the point of these permits? Is it safety permits? Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. So the permits are for public safety, as you mentioned, but also so that folks know what's going on throughout the city of Grand Rapids so that two or three groups don't show up to Riverside Park or to Lincoln Park and um, are saying, uh-oh, <laughs> I was planning to do an event here. And so we just want to make sure that planning is um, very seamless and that folks are aware of what's going on within their city. Does the department also host events or is it more about kind of organizing all of these events hosted by other community partners? Mm -hmm. So we do host some events like the annual tree lighting that happens downtown at Rosa Park Circle. It is typically the first Friday of December where we bring in at least a 40 foot con color fur uh, and light that and it's such a fun community event. Um, but mostly we just work with other organizers. So. We may have ideas of events that we want to see and folks in the community may come to us and say we have an idea of what we want to do in our neighborhood and we just are here to help make that happen. And there is probably no other season in Michigan that has more going on than the summertime. So I'm sure it's a busy time in your office. So thank you again for making the time to come and come and join us on our show. Can you highlight some of the exciting things going on in May or further along this summer? Absolutely, so you are absolutely correct. Our busy se season is now. Mm -hmm. So from May all the way through the end of September, we will be working very hard in the Office of Special Events, and we hope that the community will get out and enjoy these events. So I just wanna highlight that we have some series. So what I was hearing in the community was there's nothing to do. And so I was thinking there's all these wonderful events, but perhaps we need to help create some series so folks know on every Monday or every Tuesday, there's something that I can go to that's free and open to the public. Mm -hmm. And so we have our Sunday Praise in the Park at Rosa Park Circle. We have our Monday's Art in the Park at Canal Park. We have our Tuesday Night Swing, which has been going on for many, many years. Something new with Tuesday Night Swing is on certain nights, they're going to add a silent disco at the end of the swing dancing sessions. So folks can put on those headphones and they can kind of jam around, but it doesn't disturb the neighborhood. So we love that. Does that take place at Rosa Park Circle still? Absolutely. We also have our Wednesday parties in the park and those are gonna be out in the neighborhoods at Cherry Park, Briggs Park, Richmond and Garfield. And Wednesday Night Salsa is going to be moving from Rosa Park Circle over to the Studio Park Piazza. So we're super excited about that. Thursdays, we have our afternoons, our Relax at Rosa, which the food trucks come out and there's bands playing and folks can come out of their office buildings and just enjoy having lunch mm -hmm. and with free entertainment. Thursday evenings, we have Jazz in the Park at Rosa Park Circle and Friday, we have our Food Truck Fridays at Riverside Park. And so that has grown so much that we actually had to shift it from one end of the park to the other end, the north end, mm -hmm. to make more room. This year, they will be adding concerts and entertainment to the Food Truck Festival as well. Wonderful, we have so many good food trucks here in Grand Rapids. <laughs> so from your perspective, what is the importance of the city putting on these events that really are just about getting people out and about and I'll let you speak more on it, but why would the city put energy and resources into putting these events on? Absolutely, so you, you've probably heard all these different lists that the city's a part of, right? Well, these events help create that vibrancy. So it's not just a fun place or a great place to work and to live, it's a great place to have fun. And so these events create that vibrancy, which creates that social connection I think during the pandemic, a lot of folks really came to realize that there is a, an emotional and social connection with gathering as a community and gathering you know, with your friends and in the neighborhoods. So these events help to facilitate that. So it's almost like we make the space and you just have to come out and enjoy. Mm -hmm. And we mentioned the series, but are there other one-off events to look forward to this summer? 
Absolutely. So uh, an event that everybody looks forward to is Festival of the Arts. Mm -hmm. And so that's the first full weekend in June. So that's June 7th, 8th and 9th, which happens downtown. Also, I wanted to uh, point out there's a lot of pickleball events. Mm -hmm. So Belknap Park has a pickleball court or lots of pickleball courts. And there's all kind of tournaments. There's You Go Girl, which is a free pickleball tournament for women to come out and experience and learn about pickleball. We've got coming up this weekend, Amway Riverbank Run. So that again is a very fun event where folks can come out um, and either do a serious marathon or half marathon and qualify for other marathons, or they could just come out and have fun and do the 5K. Mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect. And I believe there's a parade this month as well. That's right, it's our Memorial Day Parade and we're so happy to work with the Kent County Veterans um, Association where they put on a beautiful Memorial Day Parade. Um, there's bands that play in that parade. City brings out our city vehicles. Uh, our GRPD is a part of that and it's, it's a great time for families to come out and celebrate not only our country, but also what our armed forces, do, what they do for us. Perfect. And we will get back into um, some other events and how folks at home can find out about event, events in our city. But I did want to talk about the Special Events Sponsorship Program, which I believe was originally started through COVID relief funding, um, which now we've been a few years post-pandemic, whatever that means. Um, and. I believe it's part of a bigger conversation with city funding on whether that funding will still um, be around to fund this program. So can you tell viewers at home about the special events sponsorship program and then just give us any update that you have on where that funding is and where they can follow along to see if it's going to be a part of the budget. So our special events uh, sponsorship was created, like you said, during the pandemic. And it was in response to so many event organizers who no longer had access to sponsorship funding that they had before. Uh, so the city wanted to help. We wanted to step in just like what we did with the social districts and the social zones uh, to help make sure that these events could still take place. So again, that we had that social and emotional connection happening in Grand Rapids. Um, and through that um, funding, we've been able to fund over 200 events. Um, been able to give away almost a million dollars. Uh, and right now that funding is being considered by our city commission uh, during the budget process. So a decision will be made probably towards the end of May on what we're going to do moving forward as those ARPA funds are coming to an end. And you mentioned those social zones. Is that, does that fall under the purview of your department? When it first started, it did. And then we were able to, because we were running at such a rapid pace just to get them up and going. Yeah. And then we were able to work with our mobile GR department and now it falls under our mobile GR. Okay. Yeah. But to find out more about the special event sponsorship, you can go to our website, grandrapidsmi.gov and just put in the search engine uh, special event sponsorship. And it's the same thing if you wanna find out about all of our events, grandrapidsmi.gov and put in that search engine events and activities. Yeah, before we head into another break, um, which we're just about out of time, I want to make sure that we have time to talk about um, all of the events that aren't just happening here in downtown, um, but they're scattered throughout the neighborhoods. And there is a very cool program on the city's website where you can look up your neighborhood. Can you tell us a little bit more about the My Neighborhood um, function on the site to see where special events are happening? Sure. So when you go to grandrapidsmi.gov, you can type in events and activities, and you'll see on the right-hand side that there is a button that you can click for My Neighborhood. And when you click that button, it tells you every single thing about your particular neighborhood. So it tells you your trash days, it tells you who your city commissioners are, and it also will tell you what's going on in your neighborhood. So if you click on it, and then you can use any kind of search like family friendly, kids activities, mm -hmm. and it will tell you the different events that are going on that you then can click on to get more information. Yeah, yeah, I looked it up, I'm over in the second ward and I just, um, it was so cool to see all the little icons around my house showing me like what's going on at the park in my neighborhood and um, yeah, telling me when to pick up my trash is also <laughs> a great one too. 
Well, thank you so much, Yvette, for coming on our show today and letting us know about all of the special events that are happening. Um, it's just about time now for a break, but when we come back, we will be joined again by the commissioner and our special events manager here, taking questions from viewers like you. Welcome back to City Connection. If you're just now tuning in, I'm Allison Donahue, and in this segment, Commissioner Melinda Isasi and the City's Special Events Manager, Yvette Pittman, will be taking questions and submissions from viewers like you. There's still time to take part in the conversation. Just send your questions to City Connection, C-I-T-Y-C-O-N-N-E-C-T-I-O-N, what a long word to spell out, <laughs> at grcmc.org. I probably won't spell that out again. All right, we already have some questions. This one is for Yvette. It's from Kim. What qualifies as a special event? That's a very <laughs> good question. That's a good question. Um, so we have ordinances in the city, and we have a charter, and so... Uh, Chapter 53 is the special events chapter of the charter. And so it literally says any gathering that takes place on public property um, is considered a special event. And so as an office, we would be busy 24 <laughs> seven uh, permitting all of those things to happen. So Family barbecues exactly. at the park. Yeah. And so there's other policies that are city commission policies and administrative policies that have helped to narrow it down. Uh, so we really look at what are the elements. 
Um, how many folks are you inviting together um, as a part of your event? What are the elements there? Are you planning to have uh, food trucks? Are you going to be grilling? Are you going to have a fire pit? Um, are you going to have uh, amplified sound? You know, so we look at all of those things. How much trash or refuse are you going to create with your event? And we take all of that and we stir it in a pot and that's how we come up with, this is you know, what qualifies as a special event. Certain things we just say are more like a pop-up event mm -hmm. where we just want to know that it's happening, uh, but we're not going to permit it and you know, there's no charges for that. And then there's also, we didn't touch on expressive activities as well. And so folks that you know, want to absolutely exercise their First Amendment protected right, uh, those go through our office as well and we permit those. Oh, like protests or rallies? Yes. Mm -hmm. This is a question from Sienna. Sienna asks, my employer asked me to look into bringing some industri industry leaders for a conference in Grand Rapids. Does the Office of Special Events help with something like that? So we actually have experienced Grand Rapids when you're looking at trying to bring in a, a major conference or, or even a small conference, it doesn't matter. Um, but we have our three venues, which are so lovely and so easy to work with, the DeVos Place, DeVos Performance Hall, Van Andel Arena. Um, and so our CAA, or the, I always get it wrong, Grand Rapids, Kent County Convention Arena mm -hmm. Authority, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they have hired ASM to manage those. So you would most likely be working with Experience Grand Rapids and ASM. Perfect. This is a question from Paul. Paul asks, I do exercise classes for the community. I'd love to help participate with some of these city summer activities. Who would I talk to about that? So there's two different ways that Paul can go about that. One, he can reach out to our Parks and Recreation Department uh, because they do exercise classes and they mm -hmm. too are doing exercise classes every day, I believe, of the week. And a lot of them are free. And again, you can go to Grand Rapids and my.gov events and activities and you can look and see the days and all the free classes that they have. Um, and the other way is, going to that website, we give the event organizer's name and contact information, mm -hmm. and you can reach out th to them directly, whether you wanna be a part of their event, maybe you wanna be a vendor at their event, maybe you have something to add, and you can have that conversation with that event organizer and come to some sort of agreement where you can be a part of their event. Perfect, take out the middleman, ask them <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Is the Santa parade happening this year? Oh, Looking no. ahead. <laughs> Looking ahead. People want to know. I know <laughs> last year it was canceled briefly, but it was revived. Mm -hmm. It was. People, people really want their Santa parade. Absolutely. So we have been working with the organization, um, the Junior Chamber, to come to a decision on whether or not they will be hosting that Santa parade. And we are waiting to hear back from their board what their decision is. Um, we have gotten that question a lot in the community and we also have had some wonderful people step forward and say we're willing to help if they mm -hmm. want to do it again. Mm -hmm. So we as a city are trying to help put forth those uh, resources to help them if they do choose to do it again. And if they don't choose to do it again, I am sure my commissioners will make sure. <laughs> <laughs> that we my have. niece was there, so if that goes to tell you, I was out of town, but she was there, so. That's right, we will have a Santa parade. Yeah, perfect, well, and that's how it happened last time, yes. was that folks came forward and they were like, Absolutely. we're gonna put this mm -hmm. on. We have such a giving community and just such an involved community. Um, before I could even get on the phone when that announcement was made, I had people yeah. calling me that do other events in, in the city. So the St. Patrick Parade folks called mm -hmm. and they were just like, hey, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. we know how to do a parade. We're here, we'll help, let us know where we can step yeah. in. And uh, Russ Hines with Riverbank Events and Media, who does the um, Amway Riverbank Run, and also our 4th of July celebration mm -hmm. at Anabawan Park, he called and mm -hmm. said, where can I help? Mm -hmm. And so there's some great folks uh, willing to help, wanting to be involved. Mm -hmm. And there's interest from the community because they're mm -hmm. asking in May. Yes. That's right. So <laughs> there's definitely, definitely interest. So this question is for the commissioner. Commissioner, do you imagine uh, the zoning changes to have a major impact on what neighborhoods look like, mm -hmm. especially in historic neighborhoods mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. our Heritage Hill yeah. neighborhoods? Yeah. I think the I think that was some of the contention point, right? Mm -hmm. When we went through the process of having these these conversations about the zoning changes. Yes, the traditional neighborhoods 
did have more of the zoning changes were going to impact them. And the reason for that is because they are the most connected into our business districts as well as our other transit areas and more of our micro mobility pieces. So if we're going to make these changes, we have to make sure people are able to get in and out of those areas. And so, um, yes, I think it'll look different. Is it going to change overnight? I don't think so. Um, I'll be on the commission. I'm, 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 I'm running on a post this year. And so I'll be on the commission for the next four years. And so it'll be important for me for us to me measure, monitor, um, how are these being implemented? And that was actually all of the commissioners is how will we know what does that progress look like? And so um, I don't see it happening overnight, uh, but I know that things are changing. We're looking at two huge developments that are gonna happen in our downtown area. Neighborhood businesses are changing, you know, um, and so it is inevitable and also we'll wanna continue to keep that integrity of our historic neighborhoods. This is another question for Yvette. Yvette at, no, actually I don't know who's asking this one. <laughs> You're not asking it. <laughs> I live across from Riverside Park and sometimes it seems like there are major events that I haven't heard about. Mm -hmm. Is there a place I can check or report if it isn't permitted? Absolutely. So you can call our office if there's an event going on, uh, or you can call the non-emergency number of uh, GRPD if there's an event going on and, and you haven't heard about it and you want to know, is it permitted? Mm -hmm. um, but again, you can go to grandrapidsmi.gov, events and activities, and you can see all of the events that are permitted. And you can go to our website, same website, uh, except that you go to the Office of Special Events and uh, my contact information is there as well as other folks that are in my office and you can give us a call as well. Um, but we wanted to be responsive uh, to the fact that there was just so, there were so many events happening and so much activation going on at Riverside Park to the neighbors. And so we were able to work with our parks department and there were some uh, little league fields that were no longer being used on the north end of the park. And our parks department, uh, the director, David Marquardt, was just so wonderful that they approved taking down the fencing, moving some of those, uh, I think they're called dugouts. I'm not a, sorry, <laughs> space puck girl, sorry. Um, but ask me something about tennis, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so they moved those and we've been able to create an event space. So again, that's more north, there's more parking up that way, um, and then there's less neighborhood or homes. Uh, up that way. So we're hoping that that's going to help with some of those issues from last year. I'll also mention, I think this was something I learned last year because we did get a couple of calls, particularly for Riverside Park, um, that the Office of Special Events not only permits these events, but they do monitor it. They, they are looking to see, are the event organizers doing what they said they're going to do? One, to make sure people are safe, um, but two, to make sure that all these different considerations are coming into place. So, you know, they, they are monitored, you know, not just the permit, but to make sure that the event is successful and if if there are things that happen I uh, you know again can think of some examples where we work together to say what are those adjustments and this is one of them you know, where is there more space and it's not even it's not that far so no, but it's not. we want to welcome people yeah. yeah and the neighborhood association as well uh, there is a very active Creston neighborhood association over there so if you have any concerns and you live in that area you know give them a call as well yeah mm -hmm. check the list though it's a good yes. place to start yes. first see if it's a listed event and then go mm -hmm. from there but yeah. thank you for that another question for you Yvette is from Juan Juan wants to know if I want to let people know about my neighborhood event does the office of special events help promote it so if it's a permitted event so that's an event that you filled out an application for a permit and you're working with our office to obtain a permit we do put those events on our website Otherwise, we work with our partner organization, Experience Grand Rapids, mm -hmm. and anyone can go on their website and upload their event onto that website. And that website lists all events that are happening all throughout West Michigan. Yeah, and I've used that event calendar mm -hmm. before, and it's pretty, pretty mm -hmm. easy to use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This question comes from Quinn. Quinn says, I just retired and would love to help out at community events. Do you connect events to volunteers? So we don't connect events directly, but we use that website, again, grandrapidsmi.gov, uh, events and activities. And I'm going to keep saying it because it's just a <laughs> wonderful resource. Um, so you can go on there and if there's an event that, you know, you kind of fancy or kind of meets, you know, what you like to do, your interests, you can connect with the organizer directly and ask to be a volunteer. And I will tell you, most events are looking for volunteers. I know Festival of the Arts has reached out looking for volunteers. Glimpse of Africa, which is a cultural event, a cultural festival that's coming up, they've reached out to our office looking for volunteers as well. 
Well, we are just about to head into another break. I want to thank you so much for coming on our show again during your busiest time of year. <laughs> Uh, maybe next time we'll have you on around Santa, Santa parade time, so it's exactly. a little bit slower, a little bit slower, but thank you so much for coming on and answering questions. Uh, when we return, we'll be taking more co questions with the commissioner here today from the community. Stay tuned. morning in Grand Rapids. Do you know what's going on in your city? Stay informed about what's happening in your community with The Rapidian, your source for hyperlocal news and information. The Rapidian is a community-focused news source powered by local residents like you. Our volunteer writers and reporters create content that hits close to home about topics like local government, business, schools, events, and people. The Rapidian goes beyond the headlines to provide in-depth coverage of issues that affect Grand Rapids directly, so you can stay in the know. We aim to uplift the community by sharing positive, inspiring stories of growth, progress, and neighborhood pride. The Rapidian is your neighborhood newspaper for the digital age. Follow us on our website and social media to stay connected to your community. This is The Rapidian. And we're back. Here with us on City Connection is Commissioner Melinda Isasi. And we have more questions from viewers. Let's get into it. This first one, mm -hmm. no name, but that's OK. Question <laughs> is, can you speak to the parking issues that may result from mm -hmm. the zoning ruling? Mm -hmm. It is already tough to find parking in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Now, if we can have even more people in each house, that will only exacerbate the problem. Mm -hmm. No, thanks for the question. I think that was certainly an, uh, that was heard throughout the process. We've heard that also as it relates to the different developments that we're looking at in the downtown area. What is that going to look like? I think right now we're feeling a little pressure with 131 being closed and also division being closed. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I, I had to I had to get rerouted when I came down here as well because um, my my typical way was was not allowable. Um, that is something that we weighed absolutely um, and, and talked about. I think the fact is that. While housing costs have increased, we also do know that uh, the cost of owning a vehicle is, is has increased as well. Insurance, and so this is the point where we've you know done some scanning, looking at different communities um, to get to that point where we have more modes of mobility outside of a traditional one vehicle per person or two vehicles for home is going to take some of those changes around uh, those zoning pieces. So going from the four to six, we talked about, do we go to five? You know, I think for some of us was like, is that a, a consequential thing? Does that just feel like we're just trying to appease certain things without looking at what is the real challenge? Uh, we also know that people, again, are, are living double and tripled up right now who might be family members. We heard that from different stories, but because of different financial situations, don't have a vehicle. Um, so one of the guardrails that we do have in the city, and this is, uh, my husband tells me it's been on Reddit, so he tells me what's going on <laughs> um, sometimes, but is around the residential parking program. Um, so we did a mobile GR study back in the fall. That's typically when it's done. And there were four areas, I believe it was Heritage Hill, um, East Hills, uh, John Ball, and maybe, I cannot remember the, the fourth I one and the first ward. Um, Swan maybe I can't I think that's what it might have been and so but that's really a decision point that the neighbors have they're meeting with individuals of 
the mobile GR group, um, connecting with them. What does that really look like? Because that is something that was enacted in the Belknap neighborhood um, when Grand Valley started to have mm -hmm. more of a presence on that on the hill over there. Um, and so there is a cost, but it's also recognizing what is that what does that look like. So I would call it a guardrail in in terms of planning. Um, I believe at this point East Hills is like we're not interested in it. That's okay. That's their decision. I'm not sure where, where Heritage Hill will fall. I've seen a couple of messages, and I can't speak to the first ward. So there are these pieces to to kind of put some of these guardrails in places, and also it is to to sort of say what are the other mobility options. We've invested in micro mobility. We've invested in additional. Now the dash is seven days a week. Now we're going to have this car share program because again, as we're going through, what is the reality of the people living in Grand Rapids? That dynamic of one vehicle per family or even two vehicles per family is changing. So breaking down this residential parking mm -hmm. permit, mm -hmm. what that would mean, and you can correct me yes. if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. is like if my street had parking mm -hmm. on it, then I could buy a permit yes. that lets me park there, but another person who doesn't live exactly would get exactly. maybe a ticket. Yep. And there's different nuances of the times and mm -hmm. you can get you can get spots for, for guests and things like that. There's a variety of considerations. People have asked us about those that um, maybe have different accessibility issues um, for caregivers. Even that's mm -hmm. something that we can work with Mobile GR to be able to identify a spot for a caregiver that's coming into a home on a regular basis. And so the it, it's change. It is mm -hmm. change, and it is our city. I used to be able to drive, and it take me seven minutes to get most places in Grand Rapids. It. I gave myself thirty minutes today to get to Grand Rapids, and these are the realities of a growing city. Um, and we just need to continue to make sure we're making investments in some of those different transpo transpo transportation modes, as well as having a more safe environment for pedestrians. I. Somebody jumped out in front of me today, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I slowed down. Luckily, I wasn't going too fast, but making sure people are just stopping in crosswalks. It's, I think it mm -hmm. is definitely a culture change, but again, that residential parking permit program is there to be a guardrail if neighborhoods do want to have that, but that's their choice. Our next question comes from mm -hmm. Bernie. Bernie okay. asks, why are city taxes due at a different time than state and federal? Mm -hmm. Not that I'm complaining about a later due date, but <laughs> just <Thanks> curious. <laughs> oh, Bernie, that is like a phone a friend question. Yeah. And really, you know what? Admittedly, <laughs> I don't know that question. I'm just, or that answer to that question. I just know that it is April 30th mm -hmm. and it's been April 30th and I'm sure it has something to do with, I don't know, something. I have to phone a friend to our city treasurer. So John Goblinski, <laughs> if you're watching, I don't know the answer to that and I'm going to find it out. <laughs> we'll post it somewhere. But I'm not Perfect. sure. Yeah, I don't know that one yeah. either. My mentor once told me, if you don't know an answer, don't make it up. Just tell That's them. That's <laughs> also true. Say, I don't know, I'll look it up and I'll yes. get back to you. Yeah. Even if you never mm -hmm. mind. This next question then sure. comes from Charlie. Charlie wants to know, with the new housing ordinances, mm -hmm. there will be an increased demand in public transportation. Mm -hmm. I know the rapid isn't part of the city, but is the city mm -hmm. planning on supporting the mm -hmm. growth of these denser neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. People have a lot of the same yeah, similar absolutely. questions. I think this is, thanks for the question, I think this is absolutely something that we heard through the master planning process. So, that, so that's why over the last couple of years you've seen us enact micro mobility options as well as this car share pilot. Um, that was just voted on, so we're still in those implementation phases of that. Um, we had, a, uh, we had a, um, a driverless car that actually was around during um, during COVID times. And mm -hmm. so we're looking at what are these options. Um, and then probably the most happiest thing that I get a lot of messages about is that the dash is now seven days a week again. And so we did alter some of those pieces to have it go a little bit further. There's a few of us who said, we'd love to have more dash-like services in our neighborhoods. Um, Deb Prado, the CEO of the Rapid came and gave an update a few months ago. Um, to get to the seven days a week is not only a budgetary issue, but a driver issue. Mm -hmm. And so that, those have been some realities. I know that the Rapid has been dealing with is availability of the drivers. One of the things that we'll also be looking at, um, we talked about this in our budget process, is um, how could we look at the um, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, uh, the IRA, to be able to you know purchase or get grant dollars for more electrification of our fleet. So I know that's also an interest. That's Those are two of our strategic areas. So yes, I think those additional mobility options are on the table. We're making that investment in the dash and working with the Rapid, to, who is the operator of that. Perfect. Mm -hmm. This question comes from Ben. Ben mm -hmm. wants to know, 
The road in front of my house developed a bunch of potholes. Mm -hmm. It got filled with tar, but it is still really bumpy. Does mm -hmm. the city plan on coming mm -hmm. back to do a full repair? Mm -hmm. So I don't know where, where that is, but if you do reach out to 311 um, and you're able to share that perspective, um, yes, they are typically on a summer schedule. I would say right now a lot of repair is happening. There is a, a spot on my commute to work and it's a very large area and I'm like, I'm gonna find out if they're, when they're gonna come back and do this because it's, it's that same sort of dynamic. So I would say call 311 um, so we can log your request and then make sure um, where it is on the cycle. But yes, that typically would happen. That is mm -hmm. the beauty of spring, finding out yes. where all of the new <laughs> potholes are uh, yes. around mm -hmm. town. Uh -huh. uh, this last question, it comes from Matt. Matt wants to know, uh, it says, my friend told me that a new hotel tax may result in an aquarium for GR. Is that true? I love mm -hmm. the idea, but I know we are already impacting Westside Parking with the amphitheater, mm -hmm. the soccer stadium, and mm -hmm. the updates at the zoo. Yeah. So, yes, there is going to be a hotel motel tax um, on the ballot, the August ballot. Um, so that was just voted for a final approval at the county commission because this would be a countywide. So this isn't mm -hmm. just for the city of Grand Rapids. Um, and this would be a tax essentially on visitors um, who are at our hotels and motels. Um, this was legislation that Representative John Fitzgerald worked on with other individuals. I know the mayor was uh, certainly uh, leads a lot of our legislative activities. And so it would be a way to provide additional funding for um, primarily at this point, the amphitheater and the soccer stadium. I think the uh, aquarium proposal was just shared that the site in Grand Rapids was the most desired site at the last county commission meeting. Um, the, the, the pieces around that legislation, so we'll know in August if that passes or not. And then I think we'll continue to have those conversations about what are the right mix of parking and availability the amphitheater and the soccer stadium, the work that has been done is in working really closely with Grand Valley to identify there is parking, particularly when we, th if we think about it every single day, there's not gonna be events every single day. If we think about what are those game days as they call them or special events, there is availability of parking in the downtown area. I think as we were chatting in the break, what is that switch that we have in, this, in a city of Grand Rapids? I was joking, like I, I don't walk a lot of places in mm -hmm. Grand Rapids. If I go to larger cities, I'm walking, I'm bringing my shoes. Um, I think it's some of it is a little bit of a paradigm change. So while there is availability, it might be a little bit further away or it might look like a bit of a shuttle. I can't speak to all of those plans, but that is certainly something under consideration and there have been numerous parking studies undertaken and will continue to be undertaken. I don't remember what the time frame is for the potential aquarium, but that's still in a very, very early phase. So with the tax, mm -hmm. how would that show up for visitors? Mm -hmm. How would they? See yeah, it, I think deal they decided it? on a two percent tax, maybe a three percent tax. I think that was it was either going to be or two or three percent. So it would essentially be um, uh, something that shows up in their bill, or if they're doing something online, these are the fees and the taxes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they don't break them out all the way, um, and then this would not apply to those that are staying longer than thirty days in a facility, because we also want to recognize that. Uh, you know, the reality is some people are using hotels or motels as, as housing uh, solutions right now too. Mm -hmm. So I'm appreciative of that language that was identified in that legislation as well. And can you give us any insight on the potentiality of this mm -hmm. aquarium? I, you know, I don't know much more than, than the public because this is something that is not, you know, city led. Mm -hmm. um, but what I would say is the, the desire was to look at a variety of sites with the last county commission um, meeting, they uh, received an update and a report that this spot on the west side uh, uh, would be the best potential site for this aquarium. Um, I think a lot of things need to be figured out. One, I think this hotel motel tax needs to be passed or, you know, uh, presumably would be passed in August. Mm -hmm. That is a decision up to the voters of Kent County. And so I think probably waiting a little bit, that's not too far away to see what that looks like. Um, probably learning some things from the amphitheater. They're breaking ground later this month on the amphitheater site. Uh, I think uh, May 21st is that uh, groundbreaking. And so some of those things will probably help to inform that. I think the, you know, when people ask, why are all these things happening, Commissioner? As a city, um, we receive a, uh, a high proportion of our revenue is from income tax and then also secondarily property tax. So income tax from those who live here and those who work in our city. And so wanting to have these attractions, these quality of life pieces will continue to bring, 
I think, important investment into our city. And we also will continue to recognize what are the realities of uh, Grand Rapidians, like the challenges right now with 131 <laughs> being shut down. That won't be yeah. forever. And so I think we just have to continue to um, have some patience, do a little bit of research and give ourselves more time. Perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank sure. you for coming on our show and answering not just sure. my questions, but the public's questions. Yeah, of course. Appreciate it every time. Yeah. Thanks, Allison. That is all of the time that we have today. Thank you to our guests for coming in, and thank you to all of you at home for tuning in and sending in your questions. Don't forget, you can always watch rebroadcasts throughout the month of May on Cable GRTV's Channel 25 or on the GRTV YouTube page. See you next month, Grand Rapids. The Grand Rapids Community Media Center is committed to creating a diverse and inclusive environment for all community members. It is a place where community voices are heard, valued, and lifted through media. We seek to provide area residents with a platform to participate in free speech, be engaged with the community, and share their diverse voices. As a multimedia platform organization, we provide and support a variety of community resources, including our radio station, WYCE 88.1 FM, our TV station, GRTV, our hyper-local news program, The Rapidian, web services, and our historic theater, Wealthy Theater. WYCE is West Michigan's only community radio station that is listener supported and volunteer powered. WYCE uses local voices to help listeners discover and celebrate different services, cultures, and events. What I really like about programming music in WYCE is I get to not only interact with listeners and local musicians, but I get to put together a musical collage every week and give it away to the universe. As a volunteer programmer, you get the training on how to use equipment, how to access music from the library, and how to put together a great show that showcases local and national artists and still has your creativity included. The Web Services Department helps West Michigan nonprofits connect, learn, create, and share through locally built and accessible websites. We help nonprofits strengthen their online presence by developing one-of-a-kind websites tailored to their specific needs. The web services team can take care of all the technical needs of getting a new site up and running, including website hosting, domain name registration, theme development, and page layout. Websites are built with accessibility and responsiveness in mind, making sure our projects are available on any screen and accessible to people of all abilities. We are passionate about helping organizations in the nonprofit sector effectively communicate their stories online, promoting equity and media access with our affordable services. Wealthy Theater is a historic theater on the southeast side of Grand Rapids. It was built in 1911, and today it stands as a performing arts center, historic cinema, and community venue. We provide a space for community connection, where community members can get together, enjoy different shows and different events, from concerts to comedy, musicals, theater, film screenings, you name it. Anybody from the community can sign up to be a member and rent one of our spaces to host their event. We have a staff here at the theater that helps make all the events here happen as well as a great community of volunteers. The goal is to bring the community together, bring audiences together, artists together, create experiences where those two can connect. Whether you're an audience member who wants to come see a show or you're somebody who wants to put on a show, Wealthy Theater is a space for you. The Rapidian is a hyper-local news source powered by, for, and of the people of Grand Rapids, Michigan. We launched in 2009 using funds from local organizations and generous donors. And this community-driven platform 
empowers residents to share their stories, post articles, and keep track of local events and issues. By emphasizing citizen journalism, the Rapidian provides a unique grassroots perspective and a vital news service for the residents of Grand Rapids. In 2023, we are relaunching the Rapidian with the Grand Rapids Documenters Program, where we train and pay local citizens to cover public meetings, empowering residents with the tools and resources to strengthen the news media landscape in Grand Rapids and become more civically engaged. GRTV airs public access television programming made by and for the Grand Rapids community, amplifying their voices to support a diverse and vibrant democracy. We provide the tools, training, and broadcast platform for free speech. Community members can take classes on video and production features, borrow professional equipment, editing software, and use of our studio facilities to create their own content. We help community members connect, learn, create, and share.